Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and this is a very exciting episode because this is the return of Review Palooza. That's right, we have 16 titles, 16 new releases, and new pickups, including Superman Red Sun, that we are going to be discussing in depth, reviewing in this video. This is not a pickups video or a haul video. It's a review video, and that is a very important distinction. And first off, I have to say, you guys, this video exists in the first place because of you and because of the support that you gave. This is our second Review Palooza video, and in the first one, I put it all on Front Street, man. I talked about how YouTube says that there is no audience for long form videos, that they would prefer, you know, get in, get out, get in quickly. You want that casual view. Uh, and also I kind of put out how I, you know, what's the point of collecting all this stuff, of adding discs to our shelves if we're not watching them and talking about them with you? Because for us, listen, we don't collect shiny discs because we love shiny discs. Like, oh, I just love shiny discs. It's about the medium itself. It's about the art itself. It's about what this stuff means to us. And I got so much feedback from you guys from uh, Review Palooza 1 that... Listen, this is because of you guys. So much support saying, yes, we support long form content. We support substance over pickup videos that don't ever circle back around to talk about what you thought about it in the first place. So this is because of you guys. Thank you so much for showing up for this. So let's just kick it right off with uh, with uh, Superman Red Sun. This is the latest anime. Well, now as I record this video, it's the latest. But if you're watching this in 2028, this is old news. And we're all so much older than we were when this first came out. But this has just been released uh, a matter of days ago as of this video. It's an Elseworlds, Elseworlds tale adapted from a Mark Miller uh, graphic novel story, you know, collected edition about, uh, here's the pitch. It's from 2003, the, the original. It's one of the most respected and um, critically lauded Superman stories of the last couple of decades. And the premise of Superman Red Sun is, what if that escape pod from the planet Krypton that brought Kal-El to Kansas, to Ma and Pa Kent, what if that escape pod had landed in Soviet Russia, in the USSR during the height of the Cold War? Things would be very different, and that's the jumping off point for this story, and they have done a tremendous job adapting this tale. I actually really, really think, I think so highly of this. And I have to say, if you're coming to this story expecting you know, whiz-bang action. Uh, that's not really what this is. There is action, but this is more of a, of a moral and idea. It's about themes and ideals and ideas. So this movie is very focused on very complicated themes and ideas like communism, capitalism, uh, dictatorship, things like that, that are not easily, you know, they, they really bring out the how each side feels about those things. So it's not like rah, rah, rah America. And it's not like, you know, the Soviet machine is great. It's not that it's complicated. It really gets to the heart of how capitalism feels about, you know, communism and vice versa. And they really try to show you how, um, it, it's a cold war story. It really taps into what the cold war was about, what those, what the conflict was about in the first place. And when you put Superman at the core of that, who so many of us know is a moral upstanding character that we, we call him the big blue boy scout. Um, it really complicates things. And it's a fantastic story about how absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So many cool themes. And by taking this, uh, this, these familiar characters like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, supporting characters from Superman, like Lana Lang, like uh, you've got Bizarro, um, Lex Luthor. And by flipping those on their heads and putting them in a different context, this is able to kind of break certain characters that you can't break in normal continuity. You know, if this is, I would recommend this to fans of Watchmen. And I say sometimes that the reason Watchmen is successful, you know, when, when, when that, when that story was originally being conceived, uh, it was conceived as with DC characters. And you, you can't break DC characters and then put them back together and just go on. Watchmen thoroughly and completely breaks down those characters. It deconstructs them. 
to a point where they're just pieces. And if, if you like that, you know, again, you can't do that with a Superman. You have to have Superman, you have to put the toys back together in a way that the next writer who comes along, because these are serialized stories, comics, animation, movies, and even the Marvel movies. It's now a serialized format. You have to put the pieces back together in a way that the next writer who comes along can, can play with those toys as well and tell meaningful stories without just having a bucket of parts. And so uh, this movie really allows... DC slash Warner Brothers to have their cake and eat it too. And I, I think a lot of this movie, as an extra, it's got a DC Showcase short, which I love these DC Showcase shorts. There's one for Green Arrow. There's one for, uh, you know, like Shazam and Black Adam. They, they really are able to showcase characters that in the past have been more ancillary to the DC universe and who maybe couldn't carry their own movie or you know, animated film or something like that. This one's about the Phantom Stranger. It's roughly like a 15 minute Phantom Stranger story. And I love it. Phantom Stranger is one of those characters that has been around for a long time, had his own title, uh, especially like in the set. It, this, this feels like watch, like a reading a Phantom Stranger story from the 70s. It's the highest compliment I can pay it. Michael Rosenbaum is in there, the, the, the actor who played Lex Luthor in uh, Smallville. And uh, Peter Serafinowicz is the voice of the Phantom Stranger. So I highly recommend It's like Scooby-Doo on acid. It's like Scooby-Doo for adults. Uh, teenagers in a van, clearly on drugs. They pull up to this old house. There's like a supernatural ritual. It is really, really cool. It's really dark. You guys, this is a really cool package. I'm really glad I picked this up and supported this release. I got a question on Instagram. Someone asked me if I thought that the 4K versions of these were, do you notice a difference? And I do. So here's the thing. This was not mastered in 4K to my understanding. It was mastered in 2K, but you've got HDR and you've got the no, like no compression issues whatsoever because this is a you know a, a, a bigger disc capacity. So with the added HDR, everything just looks beautiful. There's no like uh, the color palette really benefits. Everything is just really lush and deep. So if you have an opportunity, if you're set up for 4K and you're ever wondering like, do I upgrade for a cartoon? Do I get a 4K version? I think you, I think you do. I think this is really cool. So uh, I am actually a really big supporter of this movie. You guys know I love Superman. I'm a huge Superman fan. This taps into some of the core elements of Superman, but from a very different entry point. So I'm a big fan of that. Let's move on to a Warner Archive release that just arrived. I've kind of got these grouped by distributor. Um, so this is the only Warner Archive title I'm going to talk about in this video, but it's The Stalking Moon with uh, Gregory Peck, Eva Marie Saint, and Robert Forrester is in here as well. Rest in peace, Robert Forrester. Uh, this is a very unconventional Western. It is equal parts Western and thriller. I mean, it's legitimately scary. It's a Here's the premise. Uh, there's very little dialogue in this movie. It's just a lot of like, again, it's it's visually told. And I, before we even get started, I should say that this is a, a reteaming of Gregory Peck with his director and producer from To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, six years earlier, this is a 1968 movie. I think it was six years. Uh, so the premise is Gregory Peck is a army scout. Um, uh, I think he's army. Let's see. Yeah. Army scout, Sam Varner agrees to escort this woman who had been captured by the Apache and her son, who's half Apache, uh, to, she wants to get, she's like, please take me to, to this place. And he's like, I'm, I don't want to. He's leaving the next day. Like his time with the army is over. He's going to start his own life. And she's like, please take me to this place and no one will do it. And so he finally agrees to do it only to discover that the child that she's, that she's with is her son with this Native American, I mean, he's an, in, he's an Indian. In this movie, they call him an Indian, right? So, uh, and this, 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 this character is like, he's, he's pursuing them. He wants his son and nothing will stand in his way. Wherever he goes, death follows. And it is so cool, you guys, because the, as the movie goes on, like it goes from these wide open spaces, these beautiful vistas, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then it ends up in this the conflict at the end of the movie really takes place in this very claustrophobic environment. And Warner Archive has a podcast. And they were talking on that podcast about how this very well may likely have been an inspiration for Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight, because Hateful Eight is another movie where most of the conflict takes place in this very small, claustrophobic location. And uh, I can absolutely see how that would be the case. Surely it's at least in the sauce for Tarantino's mind somewhere in there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a really good movie, you guys. It is legitimately tense. 
um, just the idea that like something is coming for you and you can't, you're going to have to confront it. You cannot run from it. Uh, really cool concept. So this comes uh, from Warner Archive. It's a, it's a, I think it's a new scan. Either way, it looks, it looks good. And the thing that really jumps out to me about this is, I, maybe I've told you guys, I've said this in videos in the past. I'm not a huge Gregory Peck fan because I don't feel like Gregory Peck has. He's very subdued. He's very stoic. And oftentimes, I feel like he doesn't really want to be in the movie that he's in. You don't feel like he showed up. He's there in person, but he's not, he's not giving you much. He doesn't make you care about the character. He doesn't seem to care about the character himself. Not the case with uh, the stalking moon. He is very, he's a very three dimensional person here. You really feel for him. He's understandable. He's not, um, he's not stoic to the point of being hard to watch. So I don't know. This was, uh, this was my first time watch on this movie and I really enjoyed it. I had such a good time with it. And it's one of those, you know, by 1968, the American Western was kind of way diminishing. And this is, uh, you know, I don't feel like this movie got a lot of press. It's not one of those that people talk about a lot, but I think movie fans are rediscovering it. And it's kind of, especially now, thanks to this Warner archive disc, there's just a lot to appreciate there. The performances, what it, this and the score, the music is incredible. Uh, it's a mature Western. It feels like a Western for adults. It's not a pop Western. We're going to talk about some pop Westerns in a minute, but it's mostly just uh, for, it's an adult story with adult themes and motives. And I really like that. So it's very cool. I'm really grateful to have that, that disc. Next up, we're going to talk about The Haunting. This is the, the, the Blu-ray debut of The Haunting from 1999. Thanks to Umbrella Entertainment. This is a region free disc. As far as I know, it's a region A and it plays in region A and B players. I'm assuming C as well, but uh, this is the first time that The Haunting has ever been put on Blu-ray. Now, back in the day when this first came out, I was a really big fan of this movie. I believe I saw it in theaters two times. Um, it's got, uh, listen, going back to it now, 20 something years later, there's a lot of stuff to like here. Liam Neeson, who we would watch do just about anything, right? Lily Taylor is in it. Catherine Zeta-Jones, arguably at the peak of whatever power that was, you know, this is around the same time, the same two to three year span of like Entrapment and The Mask of Zorro. Uh, was the, was the Mark, of, Mark of Zorro was the sequel, right? Anyway, that, that period, um, like peak Zeta-Jones. And uh, it's also got Owen Wilson in it. And listen, this is technically a remake. Well, is it a remake? So this is based on the novel or the story, The Haunting of Hill House, which has been the inspiration for so many haunted house movies out of Hollywood. And most notably, The Haunting, the first version of The Haunting from the 60s, directed by Robert Wise, if I remember correctly. And comparing to Robert Wise's uh film, this is a very different beast. I think the best way to approach this movie is to say it's an adaptation of The Haunting. It's inspired by the novel The Haunting of Hill House. And if you come at it from that perspective, a lot of this stuff is a little bit easier to, um, to I don't want to say forgive. It's kind of a big CGI, you know, uh, of movie. It's got a lot of special effects in it. And there's like things that they could do in this movie that you know they couldn't do in other movies, like older versions of the story. You know, like this scene right here where like the bed attacks Lily Taylor and like all the, the metal and stuff like kind of bends in on her and cages her in. Like those just, just stuff like that. Um, this was an early DreamWorks SKG movie, you know, Spielberg, Katzenberg, Geffen. And those guys were swinging for the fences with everything that they did. And it feels, I mean, it's got that big, big blockbuster magic. If we look back at this now, I think we can kind of see this as an early indicator for where the blockbuster movie was going. Very special effects heavy. Not a whole lot of plot. It's mostly just characters in a haunted house with a lot of CGI. And um, I don't know, I've always liked it for what it is. I think it's best to just appreciate it for what it is, which is just a fun haunted house movie with characters that we like to watch, with actors. You know, the older I get, that's what that's what keeps me coming back to a lot of movies. It's just the acting itself, the performers. I just have people that I like to watch, and some of these people in this movie are of those people that I like to watch. So I don't know. This is this is really great. Region free. There's no special features on the disc, but it is a new Blu-ray transfer. It looks really good. This is arguably the best that this movie has ever looked outside the theaters. And this goes back to the film days when you know movies would get uh, you know they get shown and reshown and reshown. So maybe this even looks better than it did in the theaters, depending on when you saw it. So happy that that has been released on Blu-ray thanks to Umbrella Entertainment. Next, we're going to talk about 
two new Andy Sedaris movies from Mill Creek. This is the Mill Creek portion of this review video. Uh, the latest two Andy Sedaris Blu-rays, we have um, Hard Hunted and Fit to Kill, 1992, 1993. And it's interesting because these two movies are basically one story. They could, like This leaves off where this one picks up. Same characters, same bad guy, same MacGuffin. It's like they just kind of ran out of time. It, they didn't run out of time. And it's just like, okay, we've done uh, an hour and 35 minutes of the story here. We're going to pick it up in the next hour and 35 minutes in the next one. So if you put them together, it's like a three-hour <laughs> Andy Sedaris epic. Listen, I love these movies. There's, I don't, I don't really know what else to say about these at this point, but I'm going to try because you know what? This is the seventh and the eighth Andy Sedaris movie, the Malibu Bay Films catalog. Uh, there are 12 of them in total. There's a DVD release collecting all 12 from Mill Creek. It's the Girls, Guns, and G-Strings collection. Uh, but what that essentially is, is Andy Sedaris's Malibu Bay Films catalog. And they have now, Mill Creek has now upgraded seven and eight to Blu-ray. These are, I believe these are the same restorations that have been done by the American Genre Film Archive. They've already announced movies number nine and ten. I, I, the the titles escape me, but that means that after those releases, there are only two left. And I have full faith in Mill Creek that they will complete the twelve movie cycle. Uh, they these have everything on them that have been put on the past DVDs. They've got the introductions with Andy Sedaris. They've got the commentaries. They've got behind the scenes footage, and these movies look amazing. They've never looked this good. They they are very filmic. They're film restorations. They've gone back to the film elements themselves, and uh, they're just so much fun. Andy Sedaris was a genius. You know, we've talked about him before, but he was this guy that came from football. You know, he filmed football. He filmed sporting events, and he was so revolutionary in like camera techniques, the way that you captured the game on film. And he decided he wanted to make movies. And by this point in the game, he was a master. He was at the top of what he was doing. Listen, I watch a lot of B-movies, independent movies, arguably bad movies, low-budget cinema, stuff like that. These are a cut above just about everything else because he knew what he was doing. It's like he put everything he cared about into these movies. It's like Playboy, <laughs> Playmates, and Penthouse Pets, but also like yachts and boats and Hawaii and helicopters and small craft airplanes, model airplanes, toy airplanes, all these things. You just like, it just feels like an extension of his personality, but he does these things so well. There are so many shots, you know, so many establishing shots in these movies, a lot of aerial photography. You know, the thing that really separates these from a lot of other low budget movies is the production skill, the production value. He's got, you know, sunsets in Hawaii and he's got, you know, a lot, a lot of like helicopter shots and crane shots and moving. It's very well done. Do not mistake the, the cheese factor of these movies, which was very deliberate for bad filmmaking because those are not the same thing. He was a fantastic filmmaker. He really knew what he was doing. Uh, this movie features a lot of the same cast that the past movies have. Donna Spire, Roberta Vasquez, Cynthia Brimhall, Bruce Penhall, uh, but Fit to Kill is where we introduce Julie Strain to the to the mix. And uh, fans love Julie Strain. She's been great to the fans. It was a, a scare a few months ago, and we thought that she had left us. But Julie Strain is still with us. I don't. I, I know she's not in great health. So we just health. We just send all of our all of our love to Julie Strain and wish her the absolute best. But uh, uh, these two movies have. <laughs> what else is there to say? They're just a lot of fun. They're, you know, in every one of these movies, he has this like over the top kill scene. It's the frisbee scene, like the death frisbee scene from Hard Ticket to Hawaii. Uh, this one has no, not this one. This one, uh, Hard Hunted, has one of the most ridiculous ones, but it's so much fun. And I, I don't, like, do I tell you? Okay, so there's there's these guys on boat on a boat with a machine gun. They're like, Psh! and our characters are on the shore getting shot at and they have to get the guys in the boat they gotta the guy kill him so he's the guy's like i need a bomb so he's with cynthia brimhall she's got high heels on she snaps one of the heels off her shoes which is a bomb and then they attach this bomb to a fishing hook on a fishing pole and then as the boat's coming back around and the guy's like get ready <laughs> he takes the fishing pole it's like right into the boat bloop it's the sort of thing that is just meant to put a smile on your face. It's Again, the, it would be a mistake to watch these movies and to judge them as being uh, unaware of what they are. He, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was a master at what he did. 
Uh, God bless Andy Sedaris. So also from Mill Creek Entertainment, we finished the, we've talked about this in a video, in a, in a unboxing video, but we have finished the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And I have to tell you guys, I adore this series. I adore Ellie Kemper. Carol Kane is in this. Uh, so many cool, talented people co-created by Tina Fey. Now I realize as I make this video, I, you know, I, I know you guys, I see the comments. I know a lot of you guys, this may not be for everybody, but if you're interested in this, if you do like, you know, Ellie Kemper from the office, if you like 30 rock, uh, there's a lot to love here. This is four solid seasons. You know, I shared my theory recently in a video about how I think at best, every single TV show has four good years, four peak years before they have to either start recycling plot elements, recasting, uh, or just, just, like they mess with the formula. You got four years at best when you don't have to renegotiate and re, you know, bring a kid into the show where there never was one before. This show peaked at, they got out at four years. It's four seasons and there's not a single episode in here that I would say like, well, that one, that, mm -mm. I adore this show. It's so clever. They have like community has an inside language of you know community would develop their own in jokes. So they introduce a robot in the first few episodes of the show. It's like a home like a home service robot. And then lo and behold, every episode thereafter, the robot is in one of the scenes in the background. They don't call attention to it. Maybe they'll be like, you know, there's like a, a group activity going on in the background. The robot crosses the screen somewhere. It's like, where's Waldo? Or Luki from uh, from Shira back in the day. Is it she? Is Luki in the new one too? Um, they they just reference that they build their own language. And then like the, early in this show, they they present the idea that there's a musical called Daddy's Boy. <laughs> Cause like you have daddy's girl, but then I don't know daddy's boy. I was a daddy's boy. And they're like, that sounds inappropriate. And then they just milk that concept for all it's worth over the next four seasons of uh, daddy's boy. They have like a Broadway musical about daddy's. So like daddy's boy was a hit thirties musical on Broadway. And then like a, t a film adaptation. And then like, they film <laughs> this sequence of a fake thirties musical called daddy's boy with all these homoerotic undertones. And it's like, did they know what they were like? The whole thing is like, is daddy's boy a societal commentary <laughs> on <laughs> on like homosexual hidden behavior or is it do they know exactly what they're doing is it an accident or is it deliberate they get so much mileage out of that you guys this show was just four seasons of pure joy for me i had a blast with it i want to thank mill creek for this because it's 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 uplifting john ham is in so much of these so many of these episodes my wife uh you know like she's just thankful that john ham is in anything so whenever john ham pops up in a, in a show she's just like oh it's just like transfixed by john ham he's just made out of a magnet it's just like Phew! and uh <laughs> it just there's a lot to like here and it, it finished it here's the thing you know we always strive for positivity here at serial at midnight we pause we strive to be uplifting, to be fun, and kind of an escape from reality. This show did that for four, and they're short seasons too. They're like 13 episode seasons. It did it for four seasons and it never wavered. And it ends on such a sweet, uplifting, almost fairy tale ending. And uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to be revisiting it a lot over the years. So um, I don't know. I, I love it. Guys, there's uh, some Kino stuff. You know, we did a Kino Orber. We cut Kino Order. <laughs> Kino Lorber Order. I think I need to hydrate. Hang on. I'm not going to edit this because the, the, the longer the video, the harder to edit. So just bear with me here. We had a Kino Lorber haul video. I placed a second order. I didn't tell you guys about it. I think I hinted at it at some point, but we're not going to go into... I, I, did, I decided not to do a second haul video. We're just going to pop them up into the reviews from time to time. I haven't watched them all, but I think there's a few here that you guys don't know about that I didn't tell you about. So I can't remember what we've talked about in the past and what's new, but I will tell you that I grabbed The Woman in Red from Kino Lorber. This is uh, it's an interesting movie. It's directed by Gene Wilder. It's written by Gene Wilder, I believe, adapted from a French movie. Uh, it's like they call these... Where it's like a bourgeois comedy. It's like a sex comedy with themes of adultery and like whatever, but comedy. Like, you know, there's nothing funnier than adultery. <laughs> um, it's very French in its approach, but it's, it's an odd movie. But this is one of those movies that I've always been, you know, in the past, I think I watched it because it's Kelly LeBrock. She's very beautiful. Kelly LeBrock, this is her debut. 
This is her first movie. She was a model, and her boyfriend got her involved in this movie project. Uh, she would the next year. This is 1984, and in 1985, she would go on to be the computer creation in Weird Science. Science. Uh, but this was where it all started, man. This is the first appearance of Kelly LeBrock on, on, in a, on a movie screen. And it's Gene Wilder. He sees Kelly LeBrock. She's in red. She's got like this Marilyn Monroe scene at the beginning of the movie that is very memorable. And uh, from that point forward, he's like obsessed and he's trying to have an affair with her. And it's kind of just a commentary on how, how men are pigs, I guess. Like it's a fairly cynical movie. It's not an uplifting movie. It's kind of like, yeah, men will do whatever they have to do to, to get some action, even if they're married and have children. And it's, it's very interesting. So I, I'm assuming that Gene Wilder was kind of coming at this from a midlife perspective where he understands these things, but he was also engaged to Gilda Radner at the time. Gilda Radner is also in this, you know, the Saturday Night Live star, uh, early, you know, launch first year Saturday Night Live original cast member. And uh, there's just a lot of stuff in here, as well as some really cool music by Stevie Wonder. That was another reason I was interested in this, is because Stevie Wonder does the soundtrack for this. And he really phones it in on some of the songs, but what works is really good. This has, I just called to say, I love you in it. Um, but there's one song that's like, don't drink and drive. And the lyrics are, don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive. And we're done. And it's just like, well, you know, Maybe you have need a little more work before you, you you went to lunch. I'm not sure. But what we're left with is a very, I don't know, it's a very flawed, very interesting movie. You know, all movies are flawed. There's no such thing as a perfect movie. But it's a very interesting movie that seems to have a lot to say about the male psyche, uh, what motivates men. And I think Kelly LeBrock motivates a lot of men. And some, some women, too, for sure, I think. She's very beautiful. She's very young in this. And uh, it, it's just interesting because this is her first movie, but she's got this comfortable quality she does not seem to be um she's just it's like she's been doing it all her life so very um very i don't know i don't know what else to say about this movie i feel like there's more to be said but i can't quite put my finger on it um it is uh it's an odd film very much of the 80s it does have beautiful cinematography shot in the san francisco bay area um and uh it, it looks it looks really good so it was a very good deal. I'm happy to have grabbed that from Kino Lorber. Guys, kill them all and come back alone. This is an incredible spaghetti western. I had never seen this before. This was a first time watch for me. It was a blind buy, as we say. 1968, directed by Enzo Castellari. Enzo G. Castellari. Uh, he's the guy that um, directed... Uh, the original Inglorious Bastards. Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards is not, th there was one before. You know, Quentin Tarantino was inspired by the original Inglorious Bastards. And uh, Enzo Castellari also did a whole host of like action movies and post apocalyptic movies in the 80s. Uh, you know, those of you who are well versed in the Italian 80s post apocalyptic cycle, uh, you know all exactly what I'm talking about. But it's got Chuck Connors, who was TV's rifleman at the time. Well, not at the time. When did Rifleman end? Anyway, uh, the premise of this movie, you guys, this is 1968. It had to have been inspired by, I, I, I say this, I haven't listened to the commentary yet. There is a commentary, but it had, I, I feel like it had to have been inspired by uh, The Dirty Dozen, which is a movie where, spoilers for The Dirty Dozen, it's a suicide squad. If you like the idea of the Suicide Squad and you've never seen The Dirty Dozen, that's where it came from, more or less, is you take this group of, of deplorable people, these people who are not necessarily heroes, you send them on a suicide mission, and if they survive, they're good to go. You know, your, your debt is paid. And uh, Lee Marvin is the, the, the head of that operation, and it's, you know, it's, it's a mission. It's a, it's, we got to get in there, we got to do this thing, we got this mission. If you survive, you've paid your debt. This movie... It's Chuck Connors as the ringleader, and he's got all these specialists. Each character in his team is a specialist of whatever they are. There's a character called Blade, who works with knives. Uh, there's a giant guy. He's a huge gorilla of a man. His name is Hercules Cortez. He's a professional wrestler, and uh, he was a title holder for the AWA. And he actually died like three years after this movie in a single car accident, which you know, what's the story back behind that? But, uh, the team is like this team of specialists. Everybody is good at something. And 
the beginning of the movie, I'm not going to spoil the whole thing for you, but the beginning of the movie is the, they have been paid to like, we want you to see if you can break into our fort and steal this treasure. You know, kind of like you would hire a security specialist to, to see if you, he can get past your security. It's that kind of a thing. So we see like a mission at the beginning of the movie. And then they get into the, to the, you know, they get to the goal. They get to the guys. And they're like, wow, you did very well. So it's Chuck Connors standing there. Everybody else is kind of away. And the guy's like, okay, so you have qualified yourself for this mission. There's all this gold. There's all this treasure out there. Here's where it is. And he's like, so how much does my team make? And they're like, well, your team makes this amount of money. It's like such and such gold for every person. He's like, but here's your mission. Kill them all and come back alone. And there's Chuck Connors. This is before the beginning credits. So Chuck Connors is like, and then like he's like, ah. Uh. So we're like, oh, he's not a good guy either. None of these guys are good. So it is kind of like a cowboy dirty dozen. It's not even cowboy because they're it's a it's a western dirty dozen, and it is very pop in its sensibilities. You know, spaghetti westerns were very much style over like a script or something like that, and. There's just a lot of really cool stuff in here. I loved this movie. It was such a great discovery for me. There's a scene where there's this, uh, there's like a, a fight in this, um, it's like this town, you know, like this, this mining town. And there's, you know, the buildings over here and you've got the mining shaft and there's the track that comes out of the mining shaft. And so it's all under attack and Chuck Connors pushes the mining cart up this hill while all this chaos is going on around. He pushes the mining cart up the hill. He's kind of hiding behind it and he gets it to the top of a hill. You know, it's like, and he gets it right here and he hops on the mining cart and it just starts to spin. And so what we have, I think I got some screenshots. I don't have screenshots for everything, but I took some screenshots for some of these movies. Is he spinning on the mine cart and you get a first person's perspective down the barrel of his gun. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's like a video game. It's like what we would see later with like Doom. You know, Doom has a first person shooter. Sec Not the video game, but the movie Doom with The Rock has a first person shooter segment of that movie. Here's a first person shooter segment in a 1968 Spaghetti Western. Maybe it had been done before that too. I don't know. But it was just, it really blew me away of how fun it was. And then the card itself is kind of like a roller coaster. You know, it's like you're just riding all over the place. What these guys were able to do with a small budget out in the middle of Spain, you know, like the Almeria region or in Italy, wherever they would shoot these things, what they accomplished is epic. So I really, really enjoyed Kill Them All and Come Back Alone. Uh, by the way, there are two cuts of this movie. I should tell you guys, there's a 99 minute US cut and then a 100 minute Italian cut. I did watch a little bit of the Italian cut, but uh, what I could tell was just a little bit of footage at the beginning. Did not seem to be a drastic movie. It didn't seem to be a drastically different experience. Just a couple of added shots. So I ended up going with the U.S. version because you know there's no such thing as an original Italian language version for most of these things. Most of the cast of this movie is American. They were sp well, I say most. A little bit of the cast <laughs> was American. The way Italian movies work, especially at this time. Uh, is that you would just speak whatever language you spoke and then for whatever market that movie was going to be sent to, they would dub in that language. So the US version of this movie is everybody speaking their own language, but then everyone's dubbed into English. There's no original version of an Italian Western or an Italian movie uh, you know, for decades and decades where they're speaking one particular language. Most of the time it's been dubbed for some market. They did it all in post, you know, they recorded all dialogue later. So uh, that's why, you know, in case you're wondering, that's why like when you watch uh, any of the, like the good, the bad, and the ugly, why everyone's dubbed because that's how Italian movies are made. You dub for the market late that you're selling to you later. Um, Let's jump to Thunderbirds. This is the Thunderbirds double feature. Now, full disclosure, I did not watch Thunderbirds 6 yet. I have watched Thunderbirds Argo, and I just thought I'd throw it in here because I don't see myself circling back around to talk about Thunderbirds 6 anytime soon. What I have to say, I'll say about Thunderbirds Argo, and we can just move on. Uh, this is my first exposure to the Thunderbirds universe, and I mean, I've known about them for a long time. I, I think it came on some cable channel in the in the US, maybe in the 90s or the 2000s, but I never watched it. So this is really my first uh, real experience with Thunderbirds. And I gotta say, like, it's really impressive because this is Jerry Anderson's uh, super marionation process. And it's it's puppets, it's marionettes. It's funny because I there's a debate, even the, there's even a special feature on here where like the special effects guy is calling it not puppets. He's like, marionettes are not puppets. 
And then the, uh, I think it's Sylvia Anderson, who is Jerry Anderson's wife, is like, you know, they're puppets. It's a puppet. <laughs> so even the debate there, like, are, are marionettes puppets? Even the people that made the movie could not decide. But I put this on, and Bree's like, is this a puppet movie? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it is. She's like, this is creepy. And it is creepy because they're so lifelike. You got all these, like, faces, but then their heads are bigger than their bodies, and, like, their hands are just, like, <laughs> it's so weird. But... I put this movie on and I just went with it, you guys. And here's what here's my take on Thunderbirds. Like I really like them. I love the detail that goes into it. I love all the 60s style and the ships and just everything. There's a whole lot. Of, I I love the idea of the Thunderbirds. But what I came to realize is that there's not really anything for them to do. Because it's so as re, in researching the Thunderbirds show, which I'm probably going to get, it's on Blu-ray. I'm probably going to get the Thunderbirds TV series. But they're, the whole idea of the show is that they're a, they're a rescue group. When people get in trouble, like a ship or whatever, they go help. And that allows the puppets to, I'm sorry, that allows the marionettes to stay in a seated position for most of the time. So there's really no action. They, they do manage to pull off a little bit of action in this, but there's not a lot of action. It's mostly just puppets, I'm sorry, marionettes, sitting in ships, um, not moving. Just, their heads will move a little bit, and then they'll be like, Boost the rockets. Boosting rockets. Rockets are boosted. And, and here's the trick. When they show like a hand, it's a human hand. Because they didn't have, I guess they couldn't figure out a way to do like the marionette finger push. So anytime you have hand action, like pushing a button or like taking a cover off something, it's a person. And so I don't know if that's better or worse, but this is just really interesting. I had a really good time with this, but... This is why I don't know if I'm circling back around to Thunderbird 6 anytime soon. I can't imagine it's any different. It's kind of just an achievement in, you know, they talk about in the special features, really the, the big selling point for this was that it's, it's, uh, it's color, first of all, and it's on the wide screens. You've watched it at home. Most people were watching on black and white screens, even though the show was in color. Most people didn't have a color TV. You're watching in black and white, and then you go to the movies, and it's just like the entire wide screen. Because these were shot in super, you know, the, the, the CinemaScope, whatever they called CinemaScope for this. So, I don't know, it's really cool, but there's not a lot there, which is kind of disappointing for me. I would like to have had more of a... I don't know, you guys that are familiar with the TV show, the TV show have any more action in it, or is it just like, oh, this boat's in trouble, we gotta go save this boat, or this plane is, this plane ran out of fuel, we gotta go save this, like, is there more to it than that, or is that just kind of what it is? Let's move on to semi-tough, 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 uh, this is a uh, Burt Reynolds, Chris Christopherson, and Jill Clayburgh movie from 1977, and the cover of this movie sets a very different expectation from what the finished product actually is. This is not reflective of the movie. What the movie actually is, is the story of these footballers, uh, Burt Reynolds and Chris Christopherson, who are, I don't know, it's just very existential, man. It's based on a novel from this, I think it's from the 70s. And it's just about these characters kind of finding themselves. Chris Christopherson kind of goes off into like Zen, Buddhism sort of stuff. Burt Reynolds is the party time playboy guy. And the the idea is so the, Burt Reynolds and Chris Christopherson live with Jill Clayburgh's character. who They're all in their 30s. Jill Clayburgh's been divorced twice, I think they say in the movie. And they're all roommates. But they've never really fooled around. They're kind of just friends who live together. And... Um, Chris Christopherson and Joel Clayburgh strike up a romance. So Burt Reynolds is kind of like the odd man out. And that's really what it's about. It's like Burt Reynolds, like, who am I outside of this relationship? I loved this woman, but I never told her I loved her. And now I can't have her. And she's with Chris Christopherson, as we all would be, let's be honest. No, I can't say that. Burt Reynolds is pretty, pretty freaking amazing himself. Um, and so that's really the premise of the movie. And it's, it's not... <laughs> It's just weird, man. It's just weird. And that's not a bad thing. That's kind of a compliment in a lot of ways. It feels like they were making it up as they went along. There's no real... I don't think there's any real plot or story structure. I don't think it really fits into the three-act structure. But that's, again, it's not a bad thing. It's just like spending... This is about two hours, 108 minutes. It's just spending time with these characters as they figure out who they are and what's going on. Burt Reynolds is fantastic. He's super charming. Chris Christopherson was coming off of uh, A Star is Born. I believe this is the same year. This is right after Vigilante Force, which is my favorite uh, Chris Christopherson movie. So I recommend this, but I just recommend it 
knowing like know that the cover is not it's not reflective of the movie that it actually is. It's a really weird bonkers movie. Very 70s. They could only make this movie in the 70s. That's the cool thing about these things sometimes is like like Enzo Castellari's Kill Them All and Come Back Alone. That movie's a 1968 movie. You make that movie any other time outside of 1968, it's a different movie. You know, it also strikes me that as we're talking about Chuck Connors, that kind of reflects, you know, that that story of like the TV star who goes to Italian westerns. That's that's Leonardo DiCaprio's character from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and so many others. Most Spaghetti Western stars, you know, well, not most, but a lot of Spaghetti Western stars were American TV stars coming off the backside of their fame, you know, on their way back down. Steve McQueen, on the other hand, went the other way, you know, Magnificent Seven and all that stuff. So uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, Invisible Invaders. This is a 19, uh, no, 1959 black and white, very low budget science fiction movie. And, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this one. It's a little bit on the dull side, if I'm going to be honest with you guys, but it's got, listen, it's got David Carradine in it for, um, no, hold on. John Carradine. My, my brain left me for a second. It's got John Carradine in it for like three minutes. He literally has like two scenes. One scene is he's looking at a test tube and then he blows up. And then another scene is, uh, well, I, I won't spoil it for you, but he's like three minutes of the movie. But he got a credit, you know, he's he's here and he's on the back of the package. And I love John Carradine. But the idea of the movie is super cool. The idea of the movie is that these invisible invaders from outer space have come to our galaxy. We cannot see them, but the way that they manifest themselves is when someone dies on Earth. When a human dies, they are able to inhabit the body and resurrect it zombie style. And they've got all these warnings, you know, for humanity. They're like, listen, you are, this is how we're invading you. And so what this really allows them to do is, is a pre-zombie zombie movie. You're reanimating the dead. And you've got these men from outer, these, these aliens from outer space. And so they, they get the most out of it, out of it that they can. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like a plan nine from outer space kind of a thing. It's very, very low budget, but, um, the ideas are big, you know, and with a better budget, there's a lot they could have accomplished, but listen, it's perfectly capable. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting movie, but I, it just doesn't seem like they had the the resources to do with it what they wanted to or what they could have. There's even a guy in here. Guys, there's a picture of a guy. There's a guy who gets reanimated from the dead. He, to, to me, he's the spitting image of Harrison Ford, like modern Harrison Ford today, like 70 whatever year old Harrison Ford. So I'll throw a picture of him up right here. It's not Harrison Ford, but it sure looks like Harrison Ford to me. So if nothing else, this movie gave me that. I need to revisit this. Here's the thing. I watched this in like a Saturday afternoon. This is not a Saturday matinee movie. This is a late at night movie. This is a 1950s black and white horror movie. This is a midnight movie. I did not set myself up for success with that. So I need to revisit it and again, revisit the movie for what it is and not what I expected it to be or what I thought it was going to be. Let's talk about the Hellbenders, you guys. This movie has a, it's got different titles. Um, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but we're going to go with the Hellbenders. And this is uh, from Sergio, Cor Sergio Corbucci who once upon a time in Hollywood, what is Kurt Russell's line? He's like the second greatest spaghetti Western director, or whatever he says. Uh, and I think I agree with that. Some days I would say Sergio Corbucci is the best Italian director, spaghetti Western director, because I love Leone, but Corbucci made more of a man and, and his, he got Burt Reynolds and Navajo Joe. You've got the hellbenders. You've got Django, uh, the, just the, the sheer volume and the audacity of what Corbucci did might outshine for me what Leone did with his handful, his small handful of spaghetti westerns. Anyway, Joseph Cotton is in this. This is a uh, 1967 spaghetti western, and the premise behind this movie is the Civil War, and the North has decided that they're going to destroy all the existing money and reprint new money in their own, you know, in their own image, their version of money, since they're, you know, they won the war. And these these cats, the Hellbenders, decide that it's it's a family. It's like a family of um, of uh, we'll call them opportunists. They decide that they are going to to hijack the stagecoach that's got the money in it, that's to be destroyed because you got to destroy the old money before you can make the new money. 
So they're going to hijack the stagecoach, take the money, stick it in a coffin and uh, sneak it like it's, you know, they're going to say that it's a deceased warrior, you know, a deceased soldier so that no one opens the coffin and they'll steal the money and then they'll be rich. They'll be independently wealthy forever. And that's the plan. And of course, the plan is challenged at every single turn by the multiple events. People, you know, stop, like the cavalry pulling them over and be like, hey, guys, stop. What are you doing? Who's, what do you got under the, what's in the coffin? And it's just like one setback after another setback, but they are determined. They're going to get that money back to their own territory and live like kings. And uh, it's it's a really good movie. I re I've seen it before. The copy that I have of this movie before the Blu-ray, which is a brand new 4K restoration, it is gorgeous. I've never seen Hellbenders look this good. I dare say none of us have seen Hellbenders look this good. Uh, we are. I'm so fortunate. I'm so I feel so blessed. You know, I say all the time that we're living in the golden age of physical media, and we are. We have so much at our disposal. In better version, we have more selection. Like most of movie history is now at our fingertips, and so much of it is getting restored from the film elements themselves. 4K restorations, lowest price. We have access to more than anyone has ever had access to. Our, we have the equivalent of like the people that have like thousands of film canisters in warehouses. We have them on our shelves, so we are blessed. This is this is the golden age of physical media. Hellbenders has never looked as good as it does here. My old copy. First of all, it's full frame. And second of all, to achieve that full frame, they have smooshed the image. You know, so many of these movies have ended up in public domain prints and transfers over the years and those big 25 and 30 and 50 movie collections. And they look bad. They look really bad. There's often missing segments because they were like TV prints or whatever. So my version of Hellbenders is borderline unwatchable. And it's missing stuff. This is a godsend. I'm so thankful for this. I, I love this movie. Um, of the two spaghetti westerns that I'm talking about in this video, I gotta say that I enjoy Kill Them All and Come Back Alone more because it was just such a shocking discovery. This movie's fantastic, but there was something, there's something so pop and action y about Kill Them All and Come Back Alone. But you guys, uh, Kill Them All, I'm sorry, no, The Hell, The Hellbenders is, uh, I give it a hearty thumbs up. I've, I've loved this movie for years, ever since I started getting to Spaghetti Westerns years ago. It's been high on that list. It's a really good, really good story. Um, good music and stuff too. All these Spaghetti Westerns have iconic music, iconic cinematography. So if you're on the fence about it, pull that trigger. It's really good. All right, we are winding down, but we have a few left. So this is a uh, High Ballin, also from Kino Lorber. This is new to Blu-ray. This has only been out for a couple of months. And uh, as, as I record this video, again, if you're watching in 2028, we are all so much older than we were in this video. Uh, and this is not new anymore. But as of right now, this is still new. And, I'm, and it's got it's got Jerry Reed and Peter Fonda. Now, I am a huge Jerry Reed fan. If you know Smokey and the Bandit, Jerry Reed was a snowman character. He was the guy that was driving the truck. But of course, I know Jerry Reed is the musician. You know, he did Eastbound and Down, the song from Smokey and the Bandit. And that's Jerry Reed as well. But so many Jerry Reed songs, like When You're Hot, You're Hot. Uh, the Tupelo Mississippi Flash, he's one of the best, one of the country superstars of the 60s and the 70s into the 80s. I love this guy. And this is a good showcase for him because he's, it's 1978. So he's coming off the success of Smokey and the Bandit. But he's, he's, he's not the main character here, but he might as well be. Peter Fonda gets top billing because he's Peter Fonda, but uh, Jerry Reed gets a lot of gets a lot to do here. And uh, there's also who's the who's the lady in this? Um, Helen Shaver. That's right, Helen Shaver. Uh, it's a it's a trucker movie. You know, this is from the golden age of the trucker, the trucker exploitation cycle. All the trucker movies, you know, the Convoy and. I'm not even going to, how many do I go through? White Line Fever, uh, Truck Stop Women. You guys can continue. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll start on a list like that and people will be like, you forgot so-and-so. Like, no, I didn't forget. I just can't spend 20 minutes doing an entire, you know, and then there's this, and then there's this. So you guys can fill in the blanks in the comments below. But uh, this comes from the trucker cycle of movies, the trucker exploitation golden age of like 1976 to about 1981, 82, maybe somewhere in there. And uh, it's, it's, there's not, there's not a lot to say about it. They're, they're good guys. They're, they're doing their best and there are people that are robbing trucks, right? So it's kind of like, it's an us versus them. We got to save our blue collar way of life, that kind of a thing. So Peter Fonda and Jerry Reed and Helen Shaver 
find themselves basically going to war against these the small group of people who are trying you know listen if we get technical with the plot there's like a union involvement and then there's like you know somebody who's like no not the unions we're not doing that you don't tell us what we can carry and when we can carry it's that kind of a thing but really what it is is just trucker action it's just like no no that's my truck and i'll kill you before you take it that's really what it is and you put jerry reed in there he was so charismatic and so you know he, the way he talks it's like a little bit cajun it's a little bit soul like there's so much you know just talk a little bit like this you're gonna get out there and they're gonna do all them things you know what i'm talking about we're gonna drive them trucks we're gonna drive them right through that bullet barrel that right there we're gonna go to that warehouse and we're gonna blow it up that's what we're gonna do brother and he calls everybody son because i was just thinking like, son even in when you're hot you're hot it's like the music starts he's like son Son was kind of his thing. So he gets to say, he take a shot every time he says, son. But I love Jerry Reed. And I, this is, listen, this is a, it's a fun movie. It's not a great movie, but it's a fun movie. And it's a, uh, this is a new 2K transfer. So it looks really good. One of the things that I learned from watching the uh, trailers from hell Joe Dante's Trailers from Hell website where they have filmmakers come and talk about movies that they love that don't get a lot of love outside of that. Uh, they have a Trailers from Hell on here with David Dakota. And he's talking about um, the Canadian, the, the way that these movies were made is at the end of the year in Canada, around about September, Canadians know that tax season is coming and they have, you know, you have to declare a certain amount of income if you haven't invested that income. So what would happen, maybe still does, I don't know, is that between October, November, December in that area, you have a ton of people that come to Canada to make very quick movies in the course of like two weeks. Like they just knock them out. And they use this money that Canadians invest in the film production so that they don't have to declare it on their taxes. It's an investment. Uh, and so this is one of those movies. There's just very quick, very low budget shots in Canada. I think it's around the Toronto area is where I believe they said. Uh, in November, they talk about like winter's coming and everything's white, everything's covered in snow. So it's a trucker movie that's not like Arizona or New Mexico. It's a trucker movie set in like the Great White North, which we don't see a lot. Um, I don't know. I just had a really good time with this thing that's really fun. So and Jerry Reed is the man. Peter Fonda, it's not the best Peter Fonda, but uh, for, <laughs> maybe this is my personal taste. Like I'm in this for Jerry Reed. Uh, but it's a good movie, and, and I, I, if you're into trucker movies, you, you know, definitely check it out. Now, the next one um, is it's it came from the Ronin, the Ronin. It came from the uh, Kino Lorber sale, but it's not technically a Kino Lorber title. This is a Scorpion releasing title. Oh no, I'm wrong. It's actually a Code Red title. Uh, Kino Lorber distributes for Code Red and Scorpion releasing. Um, Walt and Bill Olson. Bill is Code Red, Walt is Scorpion releasing. They're brothers, but they have different labels, and sometimes, sometimes they compete with each other. It's very interesting. This movie is a 1990, I think it was copyright 1992. It was released in 93. Trouble Bound, Michael Madsen, Patricia Arquette, Billy Bob Thornton. So what's interesting about this movie, and this is an interesting movie, is that these are guys, look, Patricia Arquette, arguably at the peak of her game in uh, True Romance, which was a Tarantino script in 1993. Michael Madsen, Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino. So these are stars of Tarantino's trademark style, right? But this movie, the script for this movie predates all of that. The script for this goes back to the 80s and they've been shopping it around. So by the time this movie was made, and they even like they have a really interesting interview with the uh, the writer Francis Delia. I don't think it's Delia. I think it's Delia, uh, and he's talking about how this was brought to screen, and he just says, you know, like this is way before Tarantino. They they just the script had been floating around for years, and he's like, frankly, I think Tarantino may have read the script. He's like, it's it's a really interesting interview. He's like, you know, I think that some of these things might have been influences for movies that came later. People read the script, and then they made their own movies. Uh, with this in their minds. So it's, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. That's not for us to say. That's just what he says. But what we do, what we can say is that this movie is a very low budget crime movie that really immediately predates what Tarantino would do with, uh, you know, Pulp Fiction. And then it was off to the races after that. So this is kind of at the cusp, 1992, 1993 crime movie with some of those iconic 
Tarantino stars, but it's not a Tarantino movie, and it does not feel like a Tarantino movie. But it's interesting. It's 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 not great, but it's interesting. It's 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 worth studying. Um, I am of the opinion that Patricia Arquette is stunning. I, I would watch her do just about anything. I think she's wonderful. Michael Madsen is that. James Dean kind of cool, you know, he's just like everything he says, you're gonna bark all day, little doggy, you know, that sort of thing just brings that. I'm not sure if they have any chemistry together. I think maybe in this movie they don't, but again, not really the point. It's kind of an exercise in low budget filmmaking in the early 90s when guys like Robert Rodriguez were building. El Mariachi and Desperado and that sort of thing. This is happening concurrently in a different part of town. I think that's really interesting. So I, I enjoyed this with the interview that's included. Uh, it's definitely worth watching. It's kind of a mafia story. It's kind of a revenge story. Doesn't really succeed at any of that. Um, the writer thinks that it was grossly miscast. By the way, the writer is a little, to be honest with you guys, he's a little bitter because he was not involved in any process of the movie itself. He wrote the screenplay and then the screenplay was sold and they were like, we don't need you, thank you, we have the screenplay. And then they did things that he did not agree with. But you know, there's always, there's usually hurt feelings with writers anyway because they feel like the director's yeah, that's the whole thing. Like the writer and the director having completely different visions for the story. Um, but uh, he does make some really interesting points because Patricia Arquette's character is supposed to be like a mob daughter who, you know, like deep into La Cosa Nostra, she clearly does not look like she's <laughs> related to any mafia activity whatsoever. Michael Madsen, he's, 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 um, he, he kind of works in the movie. He does not not work in the movie. I think maybe it's just the chemistry issue. They just don't have a lot of chemistry. But I'm really happy with this movie. I got it for it half off. It was like $9.99, I guess. And uh, it's, it's, it's certainly worth that. Um, good movie to add to your shelf. More for maybe for studying and for the film education than for just enjoyment, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Because we've got two left. Uh, these are... This is a Dark Force Entertainment release. This is uh, Death Rage, which has kind of become the source of some controversy because, uh, well, first of all, this is a 70s, is it 1976? Yeah, 1976 Italian movie uh, with Yul Brynner as a hitman. His brother was killed in a mafia hit, and now he is out for revenge. So it's an Italian film shot in and around Italy. Um, it also stars... Hold on, what's, what's I'm spinning here. Uh, Antonio Margariti directed this. I like that director quite a bit. Um, who was the lady? Who was the lady in this? I'm not going to edit. Why is there no mention of who the, the lead actress is in this? Hold on. My, my brain, Barbara Boucher. Barbara, good grief. I could not, I watched it several weeks ago and I just could not pull it and it wasn't here. Uh, Barbara Boucher, who you guys, she's stunningly beautiful. You get the full Boucher in this movie, if you know what I mean, um, several times. This is a very gritty, you can tell they're, even with the title, they're chasing Charles Bronson's Death Wish. Uh, that's the whole point. This movie exists. You know, that's, that's the way so many Italian movies work is they're chasing Hollywood trends. These Italian directors are so influenced by the Hollywood product and whatever was trendy at the time, you know, Night of the Living Dead comes along. So Dawn of the Dead comes along and then they start making the zombie, a full cheese zombie movie, you know, zombie with directed by full is really trying to capitalize on the success of Dawn of the Dead. So many times, this is what happens. So Death Wish is a big hit with Bronson. So we have Death Rage with Yul Brynner. Here's where the controversy comes in. Uh, this is a, it's a restoration. The original source elements are not in the best of shape. Now it's not horrible. It's mostly around the reel changes because if you know how film works, you get reels and when one reel ends, the next reel starts. If you've seen Fight Club, they talk about how you got the cigarette burns in the corner of the frame to let the projectionist know it's time to switch reels. So you'd be like, bloop, and you'd be like, bloop, and then you switch reels for the next one. Around the reels, the changes, they're very rough. I, I have some footage here I'll show you. There's a lot of damage to some of these, some of these scenes. Um, that's fine. That, that is absolutely fine. I understand this is the best this movie has ever looked. There's been no complete restored version of this until now. So if that's what the, the elements look like, then that's what the elements look like. But I feel like they've been selling this as like a premium product. This was not, this was not $15. This is a $30 release. 
Um, now they did have some sale prices, but this is a full price release that I, I feel like if they'd just been a little transparent, we've talked about Dark Force before. We talked about Dark Force Entertainment in our last review, Palooza, and I mentioned to you guys how some of the stuff behind the scenes is just a little shady. They're not up front as much as they should be, but they've gotten involved with MVD Entertainment for distribution. And uh, here's here's where things get a little bit more interesting. They're are scenes from the, this is the complete version of this movie you know there was a dubbed american release but there were scenes that were cut from the american release that are in the italian version so they've restored those italian scenes but there's they're in italian right they were never dubbed for a u.s market so you've got you know Yul Brenner talk you know oh we're gonna do blah 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 and then they'll cut to italian some of these scenes have subtitles and some of them do not some of them go on for 30 seconds to a minute of people talking and we have no idea what they're saying because there's no subtitles so uh at first dark force entertainment in their social media communications was very resistant they're like hey don't complain you're lucky you got it in the first place which i don't like then MVD kind of gets in the scene and they're like, we suggest a replacement program. So this is in the process of having a replacement disc issued. They've pulled this version from the, uh, from the, the website, the Dark Force Superstore website, in preparation for remastering it. So I believe I'll be able to get the replacement disc at some point. But listen, if I did not get a replacement disc, I would be happy. This is a good movie. I really enjoyed this movie. Uh, Yul Brenner's fantastic. It's got some brutal, you know, mafia style violence. It's really cool. Good music. You know, I, I love me. It, people ask sometimes, like, what's your favorite imported film? What's your favorite foreign brand of film? I love Italian stuff. I love Italian horror, Italian westerns, uh, the giallo stuff. I'm not a huge fan of giallo. I like some giallo, but I'm my, Italian crime and Italian westerns are my. Oh, you know, that, that leaves out. Like, I also love the sword and sorcery stuff, the exploitation. Uh, stuff from the 80s, like all the post-apocalypse. It's just Italian. I just love Italian movies. So I'm really grateful to have this, but um, let's do right by the people that supported this release in the first place and get those subtitles on there and maybe be more transparent about what the source material is to begin with. On that note, the last one, this is our last movie, and we're talking about The Dead Pit. This also comes, this is a collaboration between Dark Force Entertainment and Code Red, and... Um, it's interesting. This comes from they, they promote these. Uh, you know, everybody loves slip covers now. Now I like the the Mill Creek retro VHS slip covers, but like some companies are charging like eight dollars extra for slip covers, and I'm not there yet. I, I don't know that I will be there. I will say this is a really nice slip cover. It glows in the dark. The the Dead Pit text glows in the dark. The corpse himself glows in the dark. I I try to capture this. It's hard to capture glow-in-the-dark stuff for uh, video or photo, but I tried. And this is a very interesting horror movie from, I'm going to say it's 1990, 89, 1989. And it's directed by Brett Leonard, who would go on to do Virtuosity. Uh, before that, he did The Lawnmower Man, very low-budget filmmaker, and he did a lot of really cool things with a very small budget. And this was a first-time watch for me, and it was a really cool Discovery. Let me show you the back of the packaging here. One of the things that I like about this is it's a horror movie that does not take itself too seriously. I think horror movies that take themselves too seriously are that, that's the downfall. The the line I was talking to somebody uh, on social media. I think it was just yesterday uh, that the line between horror and horror and comedy is hair thin. And if you do not capitalize on that by doing that, the building of tension, they both work the, work the same way. You build tension, you release tension. You build tension, instead of releasing it, you build it more. Then you release it. It's all about like drawing it and then letting it, you know, drawing, paying off, drawing, paying off. They both operate on the same premise. And if you do not put humor in your horror, you are depriving the audience of that release that they might need. So this gets that, and it's a lot of fun. These guys were clearly influenced by Romero. They, they even talk about it in the making. There's a ton of documentary footage on here about how they were influenced by, uh, by Romero and Dawn of the Dead and all that stuff. It's essentially a mad doctor at a mental ward who is experimenting on patients and bringing them back from the dead by messing with their brains. So there's a lot of brain stuff. There's a lot of stabbing brains and stuff like that. But the thing that impressed me about this movie is um, there's... A lot of good and interesting uses of light. They shot in an actual closed mental health facility, health facility from the, I think it was from the 60s, or the 50s or the 60s is when this facility was open. 
And so the very facility itself, you know, when I was in high school, my senior year of high school, I was taking psychology class and we got to go to our local, um, it's a mental health facility. It's not an asylum. I wouldn't call it an asylum, but you know, those walls can talk. If you've ever been to a place like this, those walls have stories. There is a feeling there's an oppression when you walk through those doors. And of course that comes through here because that facility had been through so much, but they light it so well. So many colors, pink, pink lights and green lights. There's a lot of that Italian influence in this movie. And it's also worth noting for <laughs> some of our, some of our viewers here that the, the main character here, uh, what is her Cheryl Lawson spends most of the movie in her underwear for lack of a better word. And uh, it's, 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 it's interesting how, um, the underwear seems to get smaller as the movie progresses. So I think that was a selling point for some of the scenes from this movie, even in the marketing of this movie. But uh, it's it's she, she's since gone on to be a stunt woman, which I think is really interesting, is that she went from here, some other stuff in the 90s, and she's now a stunt woman. Um, they have interviews with her on the uh, the DVD as well. I think that all those special features for this were shot um, I don't know, probably a good 15 years ago. I think it was around 2006, maybe when they were shooting the special features. Some of them have actually passed. Some of the people involved in this movie have passed away, which is really unfortunate. But this was a great discovery for me. It was not on my radar before Dark Force put it out. So listen, I'm not down on the Dark Force product. I love what they're doing. Uh, as, as I record this video, they have released the giant spider invasion and uh, the Yeti. I believe is is coming soon it's, if it's not out already. So there's cool stuff being done out there. Let's just go for transparency. Let's really take care of the people who are putting their money into these releases to support them. Uh, that's the guys, that's it. That is our 16 titles that we've reviewed in this video review Palooza number two in the can. Thank you so much for hanging out to the very end. Did you make it to the end? If you did, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate everybody anyway, but if you made it to the end, that just, that's another vote of confidence for these long videos with substance where we have things to say. Guys, what are you watching? What, what not what are you watching? <laughs> I've been talking too long and my mouth won't close. What are you watching? What's going on? What have you picked up? There's a lot of sales going on right now. A lot of people are home uh, for, for reasons that uh, we all are aware of and there's a lot of sales going on. So what are you picking up? What are you watching? What do you recommend? Are you gonna grab Superman Red Sun? Uh, you know, there's another animated movie coming soon from DC. It's, the, it's a Justice League Dark movie, which I'm excited about that one. Uh, they really get to, a chance to play with some of the darker supernatural characters like Swamp Thing, Constantine, uh, Zatanna. So I'm in for that one as well. We'll be talking about that one. Guys, thanks so much. Take care. And until next time, I will catch you later.